Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, Best Gamecocks podcast on the internet. Today is Thursday, July the 1st, 2021. Today's show, we conclude our 2021 opponent preview series. Today, guys, we're talking that team from the upstate as South Carolina and Clemson renew their rivalry once again this fall at williams Bryce Stadium. Guys, we'll break down the Clemson Tigers in their entirety. First things, we'll talk about their head coach, how they fared a season ago, best returning players on offense and defense, as well as give the overall outlook for Clemson football in 2021, as well as the game against South Carolina. As again, Shane Beamer begins his career in the South Carolina Clemson rivalry. Also, guys, we are talking recruiting as Shane Beamer and company continue to crush it. The welcome homes continue to pour in two big time commitments this week, four-star offensive lineman, Ryan Brubaker and three-star wide receiver Landon Sampson, as well as a couple of silent welcome homes. Guys, I'll talk about all that much, much more and just really recap what has been an insane last couple of weeks for Shane Beamer and company as they continue to build momentum minimum on the recruiting trail. Also, guys, we got news and notes, your listener questions, and a fantastic conversation, a legendary interview with Gamecocks legend Eric Norwood, one of the best to ever do it in the Garnet and Black. He sat down with me, guys, a fantastic conversation. You do not want to miss this one. Folks, we got a packed show here on a Thursday, and it's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service. They bring care and attention other companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service was separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company. They're a moving services company, and they're also employee-owned co-op. Their movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is invested in your success. They have dedicated professional crew members, and they also offer black glove service. They offer end-to-end packing services, custom crating and packaging for special items, and cleaning services as well. They're founded by Greenville Natives and University of South Carolina alumni guys, so a Gamecock-owned small business. They also offer 20 years of project management moving experience, and they can offer logistics and solutions that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for. Guys, whether in the upstate or across the state of South Carolina, if you have any moving needs in 2021, be sure to check out our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. You can find them on social media at Upstate Movers Group. Of course, if you have any other questions, go to their website, upstatemoversgroup.com. That's upstatemoversgroup.com. Be sure to check them out and tell them Chris from the Spurs Up Show sent you. Let's get it. Boys and girls, sound the alarm just as we are going live. I log into Twitter one last time to check to make sure there was no new welcome home tweet or any news that had dropped just as we hit the airwaves. And what do you know about this big Time development. As I'm sure you've seen by now on social media, the head coach of the University of South Carolina Gamecocks football team is now officially a follower of the Spurs Up show. Folks, happy Thursday. What a way to get the show going. And right now, my blood is is pumping. My, oh my, it is a new day in Gamecock football. It is a new era in the era of South Carolina football and of the Spurs Up show as well. Think about where we were just six months ago, a year ago, even two years ago, and to think where we are today 
What a day this is. This Thursday, July the 1st, 2021. What a day this is in the history of the business, of the entity, of the movement that is the Spurs Up show. That Shane Beamer hits that follow button. Hits that follow button on social media. Something that might be very, very small to some of you. A very, very big deal to yours truly. Wow. I I mean, I am at a loss for words. I am blown away right now. I don't know. I thought it would ever happen that Shane Beamer would hit that follow button and follow yours truly. And it's incredible. It's incredible. My, oh my, how things can change. The Shane train is rolling full steam ahead. Beamer ball to the freaking moon and back. We're rocking. We're rolling. What a way to get the month of July going, folks. Thank you all so much for tuning in, man. But so far beyond that, thank you all for your love, for your support, for continuing to rock what we do, rock with the content, rock with the business. Because, guys, I'll be honest with you, without you all, and I've said it many times, but I want you to really hear me when I say it this time. I want you to really hear me. Without you all, without your love and support, without you guys rocking with the brand and rocking with the business and rocking with the merch and rocking with the content and rocking with every single thing we do, Shane Beamer would not look at TSUS and the Spurs Up show and yours truly and what we do. He would not look at that and say, you know what? You know what? That entity, that outlet, that movement, they're valuable. They're valuable to Gamecock football. They're valuable to what we are building in Columbia because that is what Shane Beamer hitting that follow button says to me. You know what? TSUS can help us win. TSUS can help us get to the top. And now all we've got to do is find a way to get Shane Beamer on these here airwaves. Coach, please, the invite is here. Would love to have you on. Let's talk. Let's chat. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about all the great things you're doing in your program. But either way, uh, just incredible. Incredible. I I hope I've got your Thursday freaking going. I know I'm fired up right now. My blood is pumping. I could spend the entire show just talking about that, talking about how excited I am for the future and what's to come. And, hey, there's positive momentum with Shane Beamer. There's positive momentum with Gamecock football. There's positive momentum with the Spurs Up show. And folks, it is only going to get more intense, more energetic, more enthusiastic. Everything is going to get better from here on out. So buckle up because this freaking train is rolling. Hey, happy Thursday. What a way to start the show. Hope you're all doing well. I'm Chris Phillips with the Spurs Up show as always. Appreciate you all tuning in again, guys. Thank you all so much. I'm on a day like today with what just happened. I'm I'm so extremely grateful for the love and the support. And again, you guys, this time of year, especially when it's July 1st, we're 65 days away from kick. We're coming up on the July 4th holiday. People are going here and doing this and doing that and and, and going a a million miles an hour in different directions. And you guys continue to rock with the content, rock with the business in the preseason and, and, and be right there with me, counting down the days to kick off in anticipation for Shane Beamer's first season, man. Thank you all so much and again like i said guys do not go anywhere don't sleep because i know next week next week and i know i'm going to break some of your hearts but in case you forgot this is going to be the last podcast we record until july the 12th monday july the 12th we are going to take the week off next week from the podcast figure hey people are going to be on vacation it's a great week for yours truly also i'm going to use next week to work on some other business initiatives aka wink wink the big cock club the tailgate for the fall finalize some of the things with merchandise we got a lot happening right now we got a lot rocking and a lot rolling um right now tentatively no daily crow next week also but that could change guys because if i'm not going out of town anywhere which right now it looks like i'm not I'm not just going to sit around the house and and do nothing, obviously. And I I enjoy chatting with you guys for that hour each and every single day. And I think to myself, why wouldn't we do that? So, again, I'm not going to make any promises right now. Right now, we are tentatively scheduled for no Daily Crow, no podcast next week. But everything will return in full force starting the week of July 12th. But, again, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. 
because we have got a lot to get into and a big show today. Anytime you were talking about the best rivalry in all of college football and really all of college sport, it's a big show and a show that people are going to pay attention to. And that is exactly what we are doing today as we finally conclude the 2021 opponent preview series today. I know, guys, you hate to hear it, but we're doing it. We're breaking down that team from the upstate, a.k.a. the Clemson Tigers as South Carolina Clemson. Wasn't it weird last season with South Carolina and Clemson not playing on the gridiron? It, very strange. Very strange. By the way, Clemson comes to williams Bryce Stadium Saturday, November the 27th. Of course, the all-time series record, Clemson leads at 71 42 and four. The last meeting between the two schools was 2019, not last year, of course, but 2019. Clemson won the game 38 to three, a blowout. We all know how the rivalry's gone of late. The 2020 record for Clemson, 10 and two in 2020, losing in the playoff to Ohio State, which my oh my, was that not so sweet? Justin Fields is like one of my all time favorite players now, just for his performance in that ballgame. We're going to break down their 2020 record more in their 2020 season more in just a second. First things first, let's talk about their head coach. Just as we do each and every single of the team, their head coach coming to his 14th season at Clemson, Dabo Sweeney. Now, what's very interesting about Dabo is something that really doesn't have anything to do with Clemson football. And it has everything to do with Carolina football and the amount that Dabo's name has been mentioned this preseason by Gamecock fans. And you're saying to yourself, Chris, what are you talking about? If you've listened closely, you have heard a lot of people when talking about Shane Beamer say he is of the Dabo Sweeney making model. He is the CEO type, just like Dabo Sweeney. And I would ask Gamecock fans this because I had this conversation with someone I don't know if it was Chris Marler. I think it was Michael Bratton, actually, of that SEC podcast when he came on the show. But I would pose this question to Gamecock fans because I'm curious to get you guys' feedback. When you hear those comparisons or you make those comparisons yourself, does it make you cringe a little bit? Does it bother you? Does it, does it make your stomach turn? Because for me, it, it's like when we, when we as Carolina are trying to draw comparisons to our hated, bitter rival, and it almost feels like we're trying to be like them in some capacity. I, I, I just, that doesn't sit very pleasantly with me. I understand the sentiment. I understand saying that, hey, a CEO type of coach is what you need and that it works. I've got no issue with that. But I feel like we've been hearing a lot of those comparisons, talking about Shane Beamer, and Dabo Sweeney. And sure, when Dabo first got the job and Shane Beamer taking over, there are certainly comparables that you can look at both guys and say, hey, they have that in common. But I'm curious. I just ask you guys, what do you think about that comparison? But of course, either way, I, I, listen, I know Dabo Sweeney, he gets, he's a total clown, right? I, and I, I would say that too. The guy's a clown. He's an idiot. He's Butch Jones with a winning team. But his teams do win. And you can hate Dabo Sweeney all you want. You can say he's a pitiful coach. He's a shitty coach. He's no good. Blah, blah, blah. Bottom line, unfortunately, you can't deny what he and his staff have built in Clemson. You, you can't do it in his 14th season. And we can only hope and pray that Shane Beamer works out the same way that Dabo Sweeney has worked out for Clemson. But either way, the guy's a freaking clown. I think we all agree with that. All right. How did they fare a season ago? Let's look at Clemson's 2020 schedule really quickly uh, of how they fared last season. So if I can get to their schedule here, Clemson 10 and two last year. And you just look at you. <laughs> you look back at this schedule. You look back at this schedule and Listen, the, 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 the conversation about, oh, Clemson's schedule sucks. That's the only reason they're in the playoff. You know, what if they're in the SEC? Like, it gets exhausting to me because it's like, it's one of those things that's never going to change, right? You know, it's like Clemson is not going to, they're not going to change conferences. They're never going to do that. Why would they do that? It wouldn't make any sense for them, right? Wouldn't make any sense. Why would they do that? 
But man, like you look at their schedule and it is so pitiful when you just look at who they played. I mean, it's like they have 10, 11 spring games every single year. They opened the season last year with Wake Forest, beat them 37 to 13. Then beat the Citadel, 49 to nothing, the Mighty Bulldogs. Then had a bye week, beat Virginia, 41 to 23, beat Miami, 42 to 17, beat Georgia Tech, 73 to 7, beat Syracuse, 47 21, beat Boston College, 34 to 28, which was actually a really close game, six point game. Then suffered their first loss the season at Notre Dame in double overtime, 47 to 40. When you remember Trevor Lawrence was out due to COVID protocol, they then had a bye week the following week. The game at Florida State got canceled, which was very interesting. They then beat Pitt 52 to 17, closed out the regular season, beating Virginia Tech in Blacksburg 45 to 10. Of course, they made the ACC title game, and of course, they got the revenge on Notre Dame, beating them 34 to 10 in Charlotte, North Carolina. That sent a 10 and 1 Clemson Tigers team, yes, to the playoff to take on the Ohio State. Buckeyes, where Ohio State disposed of Clemson in beautiful fashion. 49-28 to in that ballgame. Again, Justin Fields having an absolute field day. Now, I wonder, Clemson fans, looking back at their season in 2020, would they say they had a successful season? Because face it, Clemson is now at the point where, hey, national championship or bust almost for them. But what is crazy is people look at Trevor Lawrence's career even, and said that his career was a disappointment because he only won one national title. Kind of well. But again, 10-2 and in the 2020 season, ending the year losing to Ohio State. Oh, by the way, the first team from the state of South Carolina to ever lose to Ohio State. Tonight, Clemson has that. They can hang a banner in their stadium for that achievement. All right, let's talk best returning players on both offense and defense for the Tigers. When you look at offense, now mine is going to be different than some others, because I know everyone is going to point to quarterback and say DJ Ui Ungalele, which, by the way, kudos to me and a pat on my back that I pronounced his name correctly. I'm one of the few that can probably do so. But uh, everybody's going to look at DJ Ui Ungalele and say, oh, you know, this dude is the next coming. He's a better prospect than Trevor Lawrence. He's this, he's that, he's so great. And he might turn out to be all of those things. I I mean, I think he's an immensely talented guy. There's no question about it, unfortunately. He is. But he's also unproven. He's unproven, bottom line. There's no way you can spin it to convince me otherwise. He is an unproven player. We don't know. Projections say he'll be good, but we have not seen him do it on the field. But somebody who doesn't have to have projections and somebody we have seen do it on the field and from all accounts is 110% healthy and who I believe is the X factor and the game changer on Clemson's offense is wide receiver Justin Ross. Ross, again, who missed all of 2020 with an injury, returns this year in 2019. He had 66 catches for 865 yards and eight touchdowns. And oh, by the way, guys, that was not even being the number one option on his own team. DJ Uyunglele, we might look back at the end of, uh, end of this season and say, you know what, he was the best player for Clemson. But right now, off of what we know going into this season, I think Justin Ross is the best overall player on a Clemson offense that has to replace a lot going into this season. I mean, you, you lose Trevor Lawrence, you lose Travis Etienne. That alone is... You know, not many teams can recover from losing that type of production, but you get a guy back like Justin Ross, an ultimate game breaker, man. He's a big time, legit wide receiver, tore the Gamecocks up in 2019. I think he'll have another monster year for Clemson and probably will be a first round draft pick. Now, let's talk defense. Best returning player on defense for the Tigers. And you look at a defense that returns 10 of 11 starters, there's a lot of guys to pick here, but I think you got to go up front. And a guy that was extremely highly touted in recruiting, and has so far lived up to that billing, defensive tackle Brian Breesey. 23 tackles a year ago as a freshman, six and a half tackles for loss, and four sacks. Folks, this kid's the real deal. He is a wrecking ball in the middle. He's got first-round talent for the NFL written all over him, and I think he is going to be a one-man wrecking crew 
in the ACC. So, again, on a defense that's loaded, you get a lot of guys back. I think it all starts with Brian Breesey in the middle, the big defensive tackle for the Tigers. All right, let's move into our overall outlook, the 2021 outlook for Clemson. And we'll first go over their 2021 schedule if I can get it pulled up, which I think I might have just messed up. Let's go to Clemson 2021 schedule. I apologize, guys. I've got, I've actually got Phil Steele's magazine pulled up and the pages just flipped on me on accident. Okay, we got the 2021 schedule pulled up. So this is Clemson's 2021 schedule. They open up in Charlotte against the Georgia Bulldogs, Saturday, September 4th, maybe the game of the year in college football. Like I, you know, again, we, we hate them both, right? I mean, I, I loathe Clemson and I loathe Georgia, right? There's many of you that wish the stadium would, would cave into the ground and neither team would win. But realistically, I, looking at this game from the college football fan perspective, there probably isn't a game this year that will feature more talent on the football field than that of the Clemson-Georgia game, 7.30 kickoff on ABC on Saturday, September the 4th. After that, it might as well be 10 spring games. Clemson has SC State, Georgia Tech, at NC State, Boston College, bye week, at Syracuse, at Pitt, Florida State, at Louisville, UConn, Wake Forest, and then, of course, the rivalry game, against the Gamecocks at williams Bryce on November the 27th. But between Georgia and South Carolina, you notice there's no Miami. There's no North Carolina. H how in the world does Clemson duck these schools? How? How? And by the way, if there's Clemson fans tuned in right now, because I'm, I'm sure they're, they're fuming, I would say this. I'm not even trying to argue that South Carolina would go undefeated with Clemson's schedule. I know they wouldn't. I understand they wouldn't. But either way, the schedule's ridiculous. I mean, I think 247, are good, my good buddy Brad Crawford, I'm pretty sure Brad ranked them as like the easiest schedule in the country or one of the easiest for, for playoff contenders or whatever it was. One of the easiest schedules in the entire country. So, and I'm not blaming Clemson for it. Hey, the rest of the ACC has got to get their freaking heads out of their asses. You can't blame Clemson for playing who they play, but my God, it is absurd. Now, this 2021 season for Clemson, when you look at them, I think the, the, the leading question has to start at the quarterback position, and that is of DJ Uyunglele. Can he fill the shoes? of the departed Trevor Lawrence. Because say whatever you want about Trevor Lawrence, I'll be honest with you guys, I did not hate Trevor Lawrence the way I've hated some previous Clemson quarterbacks. I, you know, and if it, if it makes me, if you want to claim I'm a Clemson fan, by all means, go right ahead. I really don't give a shit at this point. But I thought Trevor Lawrence was a good player, you know, whatever. I had really no issue with him. You know, and he didn't, there weren't like a lot of memories from him in the rivalry per se. Like the games weren't even close enough to, you know, I hate to say that, but the games weren't really even close enough for him to make some sort of impact that like vividly just sticks out to me. But Trevor Lawrence, really, really good at Clemson. I mean, a generational type of talent, one of the best to ever do it. Number one draft pick, we all know the drill. People said in recruiting that DJ Uwe Ungalele could be better. He could be better, but it's all projection. It's all potential. It hasn't happened on the field yet. And I think that has to be the number one storyline for Clemson. Is DJ Uyunglele ready to take over and be that dude at the level Clemson is trying to get to? Now, they replaced a lot offensively as well. How about running back? Shipley, the talented five-star freshman, Will Shipley, the running back. Is he ready to take over in the backfield and shoulder the load for Clemson. Also, of course, he'll get help from his buddy, Justin Ross, like I mentioned earlier, at the wide receiver position. And then defensively, 10 of 11 starters are back. And, you know, Phil Cornblue made this point, which I thought it was, you know, a very bold take on his part. And, you know, if Clemson fans didn't hear it, if they did, they would have been all over his case. There's no way they heard it. But in case you forgot, Phil Cornblue actually said he felt like Clemson is a, quote, sprained ankle away at quarterback from being an average football team. Very bold. Very bold. And I would disagree with Phil. Do you know why? 
because they have 10 of 11 starters back and they play no one. They play no one. Now, the story of Clemson's season, at least to start, of course, is that opening game against Georgia. Here's the wild thing about it, though. While it, while, well, while it will be a wildly entertaining game, and that is the only caveat of South Carolina having the night game to open the season, is I know we were all looking forward to watching Georgia whoop that ass over Clemson, but hey, I, I don't mind. I'd much rather have a night game at Willie B and let those two scumbag fan bases and teams do their thing. But either way, it's going to be arguably the college football game of the year. But here's the wild thing. Clemson could lose that game, run the table the rest of the way, win the ACC championship, and I guarantee you they're still in the playoff. So if those two teams were going to ever play that game, it's got to be early in the season, which they are. Because either team, I think, can still achieve their goals if they lose the game. But it's certainly going to be one for the ages. I think it's going to be a fantastic football game. Like I said, guys, the game of the year in college football. And that'll be a really interesting one to set the tone, though, for Clemson's season as they navigate and try to get back to the playoff. Now, from the South Carolina side of things, let's finally get to that. The outlook of the South Carolina-Clemson game, the Gamecocks season finale at williams Bryce Stadium. And Shane Beamer's first experience as the head coach in the rivalry now. Not his first ever experience, of course. Shane Beamer knows what it feels like to beat Clemson. He knows what it feels like to go to their place and beat Clemson. Beat them in 09 and beat them in 10. Beat them both years. So Shane Beamer knows what it feels like to be in this rivalry. He's not going to be a coach that's a stranger to what Carolina Clemson means. Right. But you think back, each and every single coach, it you feel like early on puts their stamp on the rivalry in some way, whether it be positive or negative. You know, I think a Steve Spurrier, and Steve Spurrier was, was very easy. It was just the easy little quips and 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 his his mannerisms and, and needling Clemson and this, that, whatever. And you know, we all we all remember we, as he got further in his career and the game clock started winning, he's like, you know, we're, we may not be LSU, we may not be Alabama, but we ain't Clemson. That's for sure. And he kept going and kept going, kept jabbing Dabo, jabbing Dabo, jabbing Dabo, back when times were good. I think of Will Muschamp. Of course, his first kind of Clemson game was miserable, 56-7. to seven. But what came of that? The, the no handshake at midfield and and, and Carolina players accusing Clemson players of calling them racial slurs. And, I mean, that the, the rivalry was a complete shit show under Will Muschamp. Let's call it for what it is. I mean, there really was not a close game in the Will Muschamp era in the South Carolina Clemson rivalry. People are going to argue 2018 and Jake Bentley's 500-yard passing game. Sure. Go right ahead. But realistically, we lost that game by 21, and were we really ever threatening to win the ballgame? No. No, I don't think so. Not particularly. So, you know, winning year one, and I have this question posed. I posed this question on social media, and I have this question written here in my notes. What would be a, quote-unquote, successful result against Clemson this season? Because winning game, winning the game this year against Clemson, winning Shane Beamer's first game against Clemson, is it realistically in the cards? I don't think so. Let's call it for what it is. Clemson is on a different level than South Carolina is right now. There's just no other way to put it. But I think it's very important for South Carolina sooner rather than later to reestablish just even competitiveness in this game. Guys, Clemson has won the last four games over South Carolina by an average, by an average of 32 points. 32, guys. I mean, it hasn't even been competitive. That's something Will Muschamp for whatever. I don't know what it was. You know, we won some big games while Will Muschamp was the head coach. We lost some games, right? But, bro, we didn't even compete. Didn't even compete against Clemson. And while it may not be, you know, to some it is the most important game of the season. I say winning the SEC is the most important goal. But the rivalry is massively important to 
Gamecocks have passed to the fan base, to the administration, to everyone in this state. It is massively, massively important. And the sooner Shane Beamer can get the Gamecocks competitive in this game again, not even win this game, but competitive in this game, the better. I think, guys, I'll tell you, in year one of Shane Beamer, and, you know, you hope, and we like to think by this point, you're coming into the Clemson game with a bull bid locked up. You know, you're not having to come into the game with that on the line. Realistically, I think if you can make it a, just make it a fourth quarter game. Put a little fear in Clemson. Make Clemson keep their starters in. Make Clemson sweat a little bit, right? I kind of say the same thing about Clemson that I said about the Georgia game a few weeks ago when we broke them down. Play your ass off for 60 minutes. Give them hell for 60 minutes. I don't care if they beat you by seven. I don't care if they beat you by 14, 21. I don't care what it is. But make them, when that game's over, say, damn, I don't want to play them again. Damn, we do not want another piece of South Carolina. Hey, we got the win. We're happy with it, whatever. But, man, that was a grueling 60 minutes. Give them hell. Give them hell. Leave your mark. You don't have to win in year one. Realistically, you're not going to win in year one. You're not. Clemson's far superior to you talent-wise. But a successful result, make it a fourth quarter game. Make them sweat a little bit and give them a scare. You've got to at least first get some competitiveness back to this rivalry because it is severely lacking. Guys, I talked to Taj Boyd over the weekend. And I know some of you say, oh, Taj, he's a tater, this, that. And I get it, man. He played for Clemson. I mean, we beat him, whatever. He's a nice guy. Honestly, I thought he was a cool dude. He's a cool dude. Taj said the same thing. He said, dude, we got to get Carolina back because, honestly, the way the games are going, it's not even fun. And I don't think he was saying that to be, like, funny or, like, picking at me or picking at South Carolina. I think he was being genuine. Like, bro, it's, you know, it was fun to watch Carolina Clemson when it was a top 10 matchup, top 15 matchup. Now, it's not even fun anymore. So, while it may not be because you've noticed, you haven't heard Shane Beamer say a word about Clemson, which I think is genius. It's smart. We need to worry about what we're doing in our building. We don't need to worry about what Clemson's doing. Don't need to worry about it at all. But while it may not be priority number one on Shane Beamer's list, you can't deny it's extremely important to reestablish, if nothing else, competitiveness and give a feeling of, okay, we are close to reestablishing order in this rivalry. Because it just got so out of hand with the last regime. It got so unbelievably out of hand. So if you can play them close, hey, even if you lose by 14, you lose by 10, give them a scare, make them sweat. You think to yourself when you feel like coming out of that game, okay, we're not that far off from turning the tide, taking one back from Clemson, ending the God-forbidden streak. And all of a sudden, things start to turn in your program. So it's big. There's no question. And we need to see this thing turn around in this rivalry sooner rather than later. But, hey, I'll leave you on this, too, for the overall outlook. I asked Phil Cornblue this question, but I'm going to answer my own question to you guys. What does South Carolina have to do to turn the tide in the rivalry? I think certainly the coaching change with a culture change is going to help. The way this team attacks Each and every single game, the way they play the game is going to help. But you know what it really comes down to, guys, if you really want to boil it down, because many of you ask me this question. What does South Carolina got to do to beat Clemson? It's all about the Jimmys and Joes. You got to go get some big-time ball players. You have got to, and we're seeing it right now, but you have got to elevate the way that you recruit. Because Clemson has recruited at a level that is much different than you over the last six, seven, eight years. You've got to get some game-changing type of ball players. Bottom line. You see that happen. You start to give Clemson a scare every now and then or every year. You add in those pieces, and you will beat Clemson at some point. And you will turn the tide in the rivalry. And I think it's only a matter of time. I think it's only a matter of time. All right. 
That is the breakdown of Clemson as we conclude the 2021 opponent preview series. Guys, it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you all learned a little bit about the Gamecocks 2021 schedule and the opponents which are on it. And now, what awaits us July the 12th as my official game-by-game predictions drop for South Carolina football this upcoming season. Boy, it's going to be fun. Before we get into that, guys, and we're wrapping up the show, here we go. Let's talk recruiting. You didn't think I wasn't going to talk recruiting, right? Man, Shane Beamer, this dude, the welcome homes, just continuing to pour in 11 commits in the last 11 days, guys. And, of course, I I would be shocked if by the time you're hearing the sound of my voice, I'm sure Shane Beamer has already tweeted welcome home this morning. Honestly, at this point, it's going to feel like, you know, the first day that Shane Beamer doesn't tweet welcome home, I'm going to be like, is his phone broke? Is Coach Beamer sick? I mean, literally yesterday it was like 1130, and I was like, yo, Coach Beamer, you up? Like, what's going on? Where's the welcome home? I mean, I think the guy's trying to have the class fill by the middle of July. It's crazy. But some big ones we know about this week, guys, that I hadn't talked about to this point. Four-star offensive lineman Ryan Brubaker from the state of Pennsylvania, and then three-star wide receiver Landon Sampson from the state of Texas, which committed yesterday. Now, there are also silent welcome homes that are out there, three or four, I think. So there's three or four guys we don't even know about yet. But let's talk about these two dudes that committed in just the overall landscape of the recruiting class and recruiting in general. Now, Ryan Brubaker, really liked this kid of what I saw on film, attacks the game the right way, really puts his face in the fan. Obviously, a big physical kid, four-star prospect, one of the best prospects in the country when it comes to offensive line, right? And you got to tip your cap to Greg Atkins and what he's done on the recruiting trail, building his offensive line class. It's absolutely incredible. What is most impressive to me, though, and this same thing applies, by the way, to Landon Sampson, which, by the way, three-star, but a kid out of the state of Texas. And as you'll hear from Eric Norwood later in our conversation, those kids in Texas can ball. A three-star from Texas is like a five-star anywhere else, bro. Texas ball players can play. Kid caught like 15 touchdowns last year. He can ball. Great pickup. I think it's a great pickup for Shane Beamer. But both these kids are living examples of it. What impresses me so much, you just heard me say it, Pennsylvania and Texas. South Carolina, do you realize they went in the state of Pennsylvania and plucked Ryan Brubaker right from under Penn State's nose? Brubaker's dad played at Penn State. How and why does a kid like Ryan Brubaker come to South Carolina? And then Landon Sampson. I know Beamer's got recruiting ties everywhere because of where he's coached, but going in the state of Texas and just snagging dudes, it's incredible. And it leads me to this, folks. What makes – the thing that makes what Shane Beamer is doing so damn impressive in my eyes, and I mean this respectfully, okay, but I want to give you all perspective. South Carolina went 2-8 and last year. This is a program that has won six combined games the last two seasons, okay? Six combined games. Just seven months ago, this program was in in complete disarray. We'll say eight months ago. Complete disarray. Complete shambles. Fan base arguing with players, arguing with coaches, arguing with fans, and just this shit show. In Columbia, morale was at an all-time low. You guys remember. You were right along with me. You remember all that. Recruiting was terrible, tanking, guys decommitting left and right. Recruiting class ranked like 80th, 100th in the country. Terrible. Nobody wanted to be affiliated or associated with Gamecock football at that time, it felt like. And what's so damn impressive is that in seven months, Seven, seven months. Shane Beamer has turned South Carolina football from that into what you are now currently seeing today. And again, guys, I say this respectfully, but a program like South Carolina that's coming off a two and eight season 
and just hired a head coach who's never been a head coach before, we have no business getting a guy like Ryan Brubaker to commit. We have no business getting a guy like Oscar Delp to step foot on our campus. And so what it tells me, what it screams to me, is that Shane Beamer has done that good of a job of selling a brand new culture, a brand new era of South Carolina football. He is that genuine of a human being. He is that real in everything that he does and says, and not just him, the entire coaching staff is that way. And I know for a fact they're that way, man. And I mean, guys, there's been multiple times this week over the last few weeks, I've tried to keep it together. And listen, I'm going to give you guys a very sobering take, and I'm going to be very real and honest about how I think the season's going to go in a few weeks. But I can't lie to you. There's been multiple times I've just wanted to yell and scream and go crazy because I'm like, what is this feeling? This is nuts. This is insane. It's insane what Shane Beamer is doing. It's insane what he's building. And so it just yells to me that Shane Beamer is doing things beyond our wildest dreams in selling his vision, selling the culture, and what he is truly building at the University of South Carolina. And God, don't we deserve it? (laughs) We all deserve it. It's incredible. It's wonderful. But man, and it's so much fun to watch. It's so much fun to watch. And guys, it ain't slowing down yet. We got a couple of silent welcome homes out there. We feel pretty good about maybe a defensive back prospect. We feel pretty good about a defensive line prospect. Once I get our big cock club discord going in a few weeks, maybe next week, I'll be able to tell you guys more when I hear certain things about certain prospects without saying too much, of course. Don't want to step on anybody's toes. But it's, it's, it's truly, again, I said this, I think, yesterday or, or a few days ago, and I'll say it again. Yes, I'm really happy about each of the individual prospects that are signing, and we can go through and break down you know, each of those individual guys. Hey, I think Brubaker's a guy, guys. This isn't just another dude. This is a dude that could be a starter for you for four years in Columbia. Like, this is a, this is a game-changing signee. It is. But b- even beyond that, what has impressed me so much is just the way Shane Beamer has been able to completely flip the attitude in such a short amount of time. I mean, it's truly incredible. And it's so much fun to watch, and it's so much fun to see. And like I said before, guys, I don't see it slowing down any time soon. All right, let's put a pin in recruiting, guys. Let's get to your news and notes, listener questions, and then we will get into our interview. Uh, Really quick, we'll run through these. News and notes, Debo Williams going to be rocking number zero this year. So him and Jaheim Bell both rocking the zero. Very interesting. David Mendham for the Yardcocks. Entering the transfer portal. And many of you ask me, Chris, what's going on with Gamecock baseball? Why are all these people entering the portal? I can tell you this. From what I heard, it was actually a coach's suggestion to David Mendham for him to enter the portal. You're saying, Chris, why would they suggest him enter the portal? He played every game. Well, with the recruiting class they're bringing in and the big-time hitters they're bringing in, and guys, as much as I love Davey Dingers, as much as I love Davey, Davey Doubles, I kind of figured, hey, I think we can find somebody else to play first base that's going to hit better than 250. So I love Davey. Loved watching Davey play. It was hysterical. It was great. It was funny. It was classic, but got to go a different direction. And that's what they're doing. So David Mendham in the portal. And lastly, shout out Brett Carey being named D1 Baseball second team All-American. Man, Brett, just come back one more year, man. Why not? Come do it again for us. Why not? Anyways, all right, let's get to your listener questions. We'll get in our interview. Uh, Austin G underscore 45 says, while an upset is not probable in year one, what needs to happen if we were to win? Great question, Austin. Well, it'll be the last game of the year. So, you know, we're going to know exactly what we got going. Um, Kevin Harris, Marshawn Lloyd, half the ball out, half to establish the running game. 
Your offensive line needs to have the best game of the year. You got to protect Luke Doty. A, a, a stacked Clemson defense that is opportunistic will be looking to take, adv- take advantage of mistakes. You got to keep them out of the backfield. Keep Luke Doty upright. Defensively, pressure, pressure, pressure. Get in the face of DJ Uyunglele and just hope to God he makes a couple of mistakes. Hey, what was South kind of doing so effectively when they beat Clemson five in a row? They were forcing turnovers. They were forcing, they were winning the turnover margin by a lot. That's what you have to do. That's simply put what you have to do. Recipe for a big upset. You're at home, force turnovers, don't turn the football over, be opportunistic. All of a sudden you look up, it's the fourth quarter, and you're in the football game. So, and hope for a little good luck as well. (laughs) David underscore Barnes, 76. Will we beat Clemson by 2025? It is 2021 this year. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. Speak it into existence. Final question, Thomas Rush underscore. Do we have a bigger problem than not being able to hit the baseball with all of the transfers? Uh, let me see if I can answer your – let's see if I can understand your question. Do we have a bigger problem than not being able to hit the baseball with all the transfers? No, I you know, again, I think it's just roster turnover. They're flipping the roster. I, I don't think it's anything beyond that. So we'll just leave it at that. All right, guys, appreciate the listener questions. Appreciate you all tuning in. Do not go anywhere, because if you thought the first half of the show was good, <laughs> just wait till you the second half. My good friend and Gamecock legend, one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant Gamecocks defender to ever do it, Eric Norwood, who actually joined me, guys, in case you missed it, way back in December of 2019, but he was far overdue to make his appearance back on the Spurs Up show. So very excited, guys, for you to hear this conversation. Eric is a laugh-out-loud funny convo. So do not go anywhere. This one is an all-time classic. Again, guys, thank you all so much, man, for the love, the support, the positive momentum that is surrounding the Spurs Up show and the business and the content, just everything that we are doing, all of the opportunities that we're going to have, that we currently have, it's all because of you guys. You guys are the engine that make this thing go, and I'm so eternally grateful to you all. Thank you all so much for the love and support. Guys, like I said, no podcast until July the 12th. So do me a favor. Stay safe, wear your sunscreen, take it from somebody who knows, have a lot of fun, enjoy your July 4th holiday, enjoy your week next week, stay tuned for the content, because content ain't going nowhere, but no podcast, and right now, tentatively scheduled, no Daily Crow next week. So again, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in. Enjoy your Thursday, and enjoy this conversation with former Gamecocks football player, Eric Norwood. All right, joining us today on the Spurs Up show is a man that played for Gamecocks football from 2006 to 2009. During his South Carolina career, he amassed 255 tackles, 54 and a half tackles for loss, 29 sacks, two interceptions, six fumble recoveries, two forced fumbles, and three defensive touchdowns, guys. He's a three-time All-SEC selection, a 2009 All-American. He also holds the school record for tackles for loss and sacks. He was taken in the fourth round of the 2010 NFL Draft by the Carolina Panthers and was also inducted in the South Carolina Athletics Hall of Fame in 2017. And oh, by the way, in our recent preseason series where I've been ranking the top five all-time players at each position unit at South Carolina – No big deal. I had him ranked number one, so I'm sure he's a big fan of mine right now, but you guys know who I'm talking about. Former Gamecocks, linebacker, defensive end, ball hawk, do-it-all man for the Gamecocks defense, Mr. Eric Norwood. Eric, appreciate you taking the time, man. It's a pleasure to have you on. Like I was telling you off air, man, it's crazy to think we last had you on in 2019, but great to talk with you once again, man, and I truly, genuinely appreciate you doing this, man. Thanks so much. No problem, man. Yeah, for sure. So, Eric, let's go back to the beginning for you, though, because, again, you get to Gamecocks football right when Steve Spurrier sort of got there as well. Again, 2006, your freshman year, and Coach Spurrier was starting to build up that thing and still his culture, if you will. You're from the state of Georgia, Kennesaw, Georgia, and you were a three-star prospect coming out of Georgia. But just talk about the recruiting uh, recruiting process for you, Eric, what that was like, which schools did it come down to, and why did you eventually choose South Carolina? 
to be completely honest with you, it really came down between Oklahoma State, Auburn, and South Carolina. So I was committed to Oklahoma State, and uh, I was big on them because I already knew it was Big 12 football because I grew up playing football in Texas before I went to high school in Georgia. Mm. And, uh, and then I ended up – me and Terrence Campbell ended up being real cool. Mm. And then I had, like, a crazy game versus them. And then he was like, man, come on, man, let's go. Let's go to South Carolina. Just come on a visit. Come on a visit with me and all that. And at the time, Coach Nix was up there. Tyrone Nix had just got there, and he was recruiting me at Southern Miss. He had offered me at Southern Miss. And then once I uh, I got back in contact with him, and they South Carolina had offered, had offered. Then I went on a visit, and I fell in love with it, still in love with it. So, mm. For sure. Now, I know the last time you were on, Eric, we talked about Coach Spurrier a lot, some of your interactions with him, because it's so interesting. You know, Coach Spurrier is unique. Uh, unique relationships with all his players, but especially his defensive guys. And, you know, we we obviously told the stories last time you were on about getting kicked out of practice and all that and all the hell you guys gave his offense. But what was the relationship like with Coach Spurrier? I mean, again, a really fun dude, but focused on the offense. But, of course, he had a lot of love for you defensive guys. And you guys made his life a lot easier, at, you know, during your time there. And Spurrier was cool, man. I mean, I everybody pretty much say the same. They pretty much go – Go through a brick wall for him, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He was just he was one of those coaches. I mean, he spoke his mind, whatever came to his mind at any given time. But outside of that, I mean, I mean that was coach. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? He gave us damn near free reign. You know what I'm saying? He didn't bother us too much. He didn't really know too much about defense or like <laughs> some of the stuff he say. Like, you know, just, just go out there and get after the get after the quarterback and mm-hmm. make some tackles. <laughs> no sack. <laughs> I was just like, all right, I got you, but but no, coach, he he's a hell of a coach, you know, and the staff here mm-hmm. assembled while while we were there to help bring a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of the class in that came in with me, that 06 class. I mean, it was a great staff. Coach Cooper, Coach Nix, Brad Long, uh, I forgot who was on the other side of the ball. Coach Reeves and those guys. Mm-hmm. So I mean, Spur, he was he was a good, he was a hell of a coach, great recruiter. Ain't got nothing but love for him. Now, you mentioned Coach Lawing, Eric, and that's something really cool. You know, again, it's been two years since you and I last spoke, which is crazy. And I've had the opportunity to actually get Coach Lawing in studio a couple of times and, and chat with him and get to know him. And I've told my buddies, man, he, he is – you talk to him about pass rush. I mean, you just never knew in your entire life how much goes into it. This dude is legitimately a mad scientist when he is talking about getting after the quarterback. Just talk about playing for Coach Lawing. Again, he's obviously a very intense dude, but – he gets the most out of his defensive fronts, and he's a dude that knows how to put his best athletes in position. I think you're a perfect example, man. I mean, I, I definitely now understand how you and others were able to have so much success after talking to Coach Lawing with just his knowledge of the game. But what was it like playing for Brad Lawing? Oh. <laughs> Brad Lawing was incredible, man. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about me. If you ever play for him, then people know exactly what I mean. He'll push you to the limit. But he knew how to get it out you. Mm. And he knew how to get it out you without taking away your confidence. You know what I mean? Mm. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Shit, he was just he was just one of those dudes. I mean, we used to get into it sometimes, like <laughs> shit, a, a lot of times we used to get into it. But at the same time, when it was time to go, it's like, hey, come on, it's time to go to war. Make the shit happen. Mm-hmm. When you look back at yourself as a kid, Eric, you know, like you said, he knew how to get it out of his guys. Do you feel like you were a guy that Maybe you were a little bit hard-headed as a young guy with a lot of talent, and it was a coach like Brad Lawing who had to push you to be kind of that next level to the guy you turned into. Or, or do you feel like you were always kind of a self-motivated dude and you didn't, you didn't necessarily need as much tough love as others did? Oh, uh, no, I, I needed that tough love. <laughs> I, I definitely needed that. I mean, because he, he was at North Carolina when, uh, when uh, who was it? Coach Thigpen was recruiting me up there. Mm. And, uh, coach Thigpen had offered me up there. But Coach Long didn't want me. He said I only played like half the game and shit. So when I got to you, you know, he was crazy. Uh. Yeah, but training camp came. Like I started off with like number 85. Like mm. wasn't sure if I was going to even going red shirt or not. Then like a week before we played Mississippi State, everything just started clicking. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, you definitely did play that fresh in year, man. 30 total tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss, and seven sacks. I mean, I'd ask you, and I, I'm sure 
we touched on this last time we chatted, man, but what, what clicked for you so quickly? I mean, was it as simple as they just kind of let you use your athletic ability to, to get after the quarterback and get after the offense? Or was it, did Brad Lowing, did just, did he do just that good of a job of scheming you up? Or I mean, cause I mean, you just, you hit the ground running as soon as you got on campus. It was really, I just got a chance to be able to rush. Like, mm. so that was, that was my thing. Cause Lowing like tuned me up. Like, cause in high school, I was all around. I was offense, defense, linebacker, D N D tackle, all all type of stuff. But with Coach Lawn, when I got to camp, he got my hands right, got my mind right, mm. told me where to put my eyes in the right place, stuff like that. So by the time everything started clicking, like I had guys from guys like Brinkley, both of mm. the Brinkley twins, the Lindsays, all that stuff. So it was like cool. Like I got them. And yeah, they they, they just let me go out there and rock, man. Like mm. it was pretty much like that. Like my whole my whole time at USC, mm. my senior year, I don't even think I, I think half my junior year and senior year, I barely stuck to a playbook. <laughs> <laughs> if I had two three wide receivers, <laughs> just go over there and then come and blitz or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like something crazy. But no, it was cool though. I enjoy I enjoyed my time in Columbia. I love it. I got number great to say about Columbia and the state of South Carolina. The coaches, Beamer's there. I absolutely love Coach Beamer. So, yeah, we're definitely going to. I was going to say we're definitely going to get into that more in just a second. I, I know it probably tickled you, and I ranked the top linebackers in school history. I, I had your buddy Jasper Brinkley like right behind you, so I'm sure you were going to give him some shit about that. But uh, <laughs> no, I had some great players on that defense too with you. I, I want to jump to the 2007 season, Eric, because of course, and I was looking at the stats, man, and again, you just forget how good those years were. I mean, 69 total tackles, but you had 19 and a half tackles for loss. And of course you had the two touchdowns in the Kentucky game. I really feel like the Kentucky game where you sort of burst on the scene and become, it became a, a national figure, if you will. And of course, who can forget the video of you with the alma mater playing. And that, that's obviously something small, but beloved by Gamecock fans, but that 2007 Kentucky game, obviously they were really highly ranked with, with Andre Woodson and, of course, Corey Boyd had a great night. You had a great night, and everything seemed to click on that Thursday night. But, again, for you, was it just right place, right time? Or, I mean, it was just one of those magical nights, man, where it just seemed like the ball sort of found you and you were able to scoop and score, and the rest is history. To be completely honest, it was, it was just one of those nights. It was like – I mean, it kind of went from everything we, we practiced, picking up the ball all the time mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But, shit, I mean, I think it was, I think it was Jonathan Williams – and Casper Brinkley or either mm. Cliff Matthews. Somebody got in. Somebody got back there to the quarterback. I think mm. we had just – something happened on offense. I think Wes Saunders had – did something, fumbled the ball mm. or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it was Wes. Wes did fumble the ball. I remember because yeah, the last yeah. time I had him on, he talked about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They, that whole game was like – I was like, damn, I'm like – it's kind of pissed I wasn't making the plays that I yeah. wanted to make. And then those – those plays happen, and I'm just like, all right, well, shit. After the first one, I'm like, all right, that's cool. Like, that's whatever. But the second one, I'm like, all right, cool. Now we could, now we mm. can turn this shit up a little bit. Like, yeah. So it, it ended up being cool, but it was, it was, it was a hell of a night, though, especially yeah. after. Now again, especially after. Now, now you were, uh, you were in Kennesaw, Georgia, again, man. But I, I, I failed to hear if Georgia offered you or not. You always played pretty well against the Dogs. I mean, one of the, one of the most memorable plays, because I hated Georgia, and I was at the 07 Georgia game, and one of the most memorable plays, for, memorable plays for me early on in your career was, you know, Georgia loved to run this little play action, fake the, uh, fake the sweep type of deal. Quarterback will sit back there for two, three seconds, then turn around and try to throw the deep bomb. You did not fall for it, and you just took out Matthew Stafford and, like, looked over to the sideline and were flexing and everything, like, how much fun was it, I guess, going up against Georgia and Sanford? And obviously that 07 game, man, when you guys beat them was incredible. I, I, I love going against Georgia. I tried to stick it to them every time. <laughs> I, I wasn't necessarily trying to be a Bulldog, but they were recruiting me. Bobo was recruiting right. me. But he was just giving me the runaround. Hmm. And I'm like, man, don't bring me up here for, for this and that. Like, Because in my head, like, minus the stars, I always knew, like, I know how to ball. You know what I'm saying? I grew up right. playing football in Texas. is a whole different breed. Like, so once I got to the, I think it was the East-West or the North-South game right before I got to USC, mm. I'm playing against a bunch of those guys, some of those guys going to UGA. And I'm like, y'all ain't, y'all ain't all that good like y'all hyped up to be. <laughs> 
I think we went for like I had like eight tackles, four sacks before that. Mm. Like during that game and shit. And I'm just like, uh, that was all to that was all to Bobo. It was mm. in that whole UGA staff. <laughs> it was I ain't gonna lie to you. It was always a big fuck you coming from me. Yes. <laughs> 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 Which how how funny that life comes full circle with the, with the Mike Bobo stuff that just recently happened and Auburn going to be coming to Willie B. Which a lot of Carolina fans would agree with you in the uh, the fuck Bobo sentiment. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, but no, nah, man. So I, I'd love for you to retell that story, Eric. I know I touched on it earlier about you guys getting kicked out of practice because I know you didn't mind at all, man. It's like, hey, we get the night off, no big deal. And Spurrier hated you guys hitting his receivers, hitting his quarterbacks. But for you guys, it was like a you know it was it was opportunity to kind of pick on those offensive guys a little bit. Yeah, man, it was uh, I don't know, shit was crazy. It was like our DBs just started. They kind of they kind of got it going, like picking off the, you know, what I'm saying picking off Garcia and them, Beecher and uh, shit, whoever the else, whoever the else we had back there. Like they had it going from like Pascal and shit. You know what I'm saying? And then we went to team, and then once we got the team, it was like, <laughs> hey, we finna take the heads off. Like fuck this, like. And it was start, started like, all right, cool. I think uh, somebody hit the quarterback. And then I ended up doing the shit again, hitting the quarterback. Right. And Mo Brown, like, Mo Brown catches his hitch. As soon as he turn around, just lift him off his shit. Like, damn near flip him up, like, backwards. You right. know what I'm saying? And Spurge. Right. Oh, you got, you got, get the, you got, get fucking, get, get out of here. <laughs> All this shit, they yelling at Coach Nix and everybody else, and control your guys, and they don't know how to practice. And just all, all type. He always wanted to practice like pros, but mm. I mean, it, it was so damn physical in the SEC. It was like mm. you can't just have that pity pass shit like it's the NFL or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, for like, sure. Good times, but yeah, shit, <laughs> I drill, all that shit. Like, man, we, we we competed. That was the whole thing. Like we love competing. Mm. Like. And we could get in fights on the field. I remember fights with Andy Boyd, Sorensen, all, all of them. But once we got in the locker room, everybody was good. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. It was always love, still is. Yeah, for sure. No, for sure. I, I, I want to move into, Eric, the Carolina-Clemson rivalry because you had some success in that one as well. Um, had a tackle for loss and sack in the 2006 game. And then the 2009 game, you guys defensively dominated. You had a tackle for loss in that one. But – you had a fumble recovery in that Clemson game as well in 2009. You went two and two against them. But, again, to be a senior, especially in 09, and that to be your last game at williams Bryce and close out your career in that fashion, really, like I said, just an ass kick in a Clemson after they take the opening kick back and people are like, oh, my God, you know, what's about to happen? But you guys just dominated the rest of that game. I mean, just, just talk about that rivalry overall. Again, I'm sure coming in, maybe you weren't quite as familiar with it, as, as maybe the in-state guys were, but I think you got you got acclimated to it very, very quickly. Yeah, I got acclimated to it real quick. And, I mean, it's still – I'm petty. Like, I can see a Clemson fan <laughs> on the highway, like, when I'm in my car, my truck, and I'm, I'm slowing down just like <laughs> – I don't care if it's your 70-year-old grandma, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it is what Love it is. that energy. Love that energy. Yeah, for sure. But like, I, like I said, closing closing your career out at Willie B, beating them like that. I mean, that that had to be about as good as you could draw at the end of your career at at, at Williams Bryce. Yeah, man, it was. I mean, it was good. It was good. I mean, had to close it out that way. I wouldn't have had it no other way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Losing to Clemson, your last game. Couldn't do it. But there's a lot of things in life that suck. <laughs> That's one, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. Yeah. For sure. Now, before we talk about the old Miss game, obviously, man, that 2009 old Miss game, which is just one of those that will forever be remembered in Gamecocks history. I want to first, man, that Georgia game. Again, I mentioned Georgia, but you had the pick six, and I went back and watched the highlight. Bro, you were getting after. You had a little more speed than I think people gave you credit for. I know your teammates probably would have ragged you if you wouldn't have gotten in, though, but <laughs> just talk about that, man. I'm sure even though you guys didn't win the game, which, you know, you look back at that game and you're like, Man, like it really close. I mean, that was a hell of a football game, but that's got to be like one of the cool highlights of your career was that pick six in Athens. Oh, no, that was that Georgia game was it. We had prepared so much for them. Mm-hmm. Like in practice, like the, the staff, the defense staff we had, everybody that was doing like quality control and scout team plays and shit. Like with that staff, damn near every, every, every play they ran, we knew. So, like, on that particular play, uh, 
on that particular play with uh on that particular play on that pick six, it was like when that the fullback motion in or something. Mm. You look back at it, you go like see me move in and pop back out. Then it's like all right, they're going into Asia. Mm. And I had already picked it. I had already picked it off of practice before. So in my head, I'm like all right, yeah. cool. Right? Let's go make let's go make it happen. And then it just. Man, that shit was like it happened in slow motion. Mm. But For sure. shout out yeah. to Joe Cox, though. <laughs> Hell of a throw by Joe Cox. <laughs> Hell of a throw. Which, again, it's just crazy how life comes full circle. He was literally on the staff last year. And, hey, when he got hired, that was honestly the first thing I thought of. Like, oh, that's Joe Cox, the guy that threw the pick six to Eric Norwood. Um, no, the, the 2009 Ole Miss game, though, man. I, I, I'll ask you this first because I, I know you have a lot of thoughts on the atmosphere at Willie B and the birth of Sandstorm and all that. But, of course, like I mentioned in the beginning, man, you set the record for sacks, for tackles, for loss. And I think you actually have the SEC record for tackles for loss in a career, by the way. I was looking at that. I'm pretty sure you have the SEC record, but definitely the South Carolina records. When you were playing, like when you got on campus, was records ever something in the back of your mind? Like, you know, did you get on campus and say, oh, what's the sack record? I want to break that. Or did you just sort of play and the records took care of themselves? And, like, and especially like going into your senior year, because of course that night against Ole Miss is when you broke that record. Did, did the records ever cross your mind when you were playing or was it just sort of something that, oh, by the way, happened? Be honest with you, when I first got there, up until like after like my first week of conditioning or our first week of conditioning, I ain't paid no mind until Coach Smith said something. Uh, Mark mm-hmm. Smith, for Black Iron, as we used to call him, mm-hmm. we was in the weight room. And he was like, "Yeah, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna be on that board, or you ain't gonna be up there with those guys who who who, who got records and all this and that." I'm like, "I'm gonna break every mother, every, every record y'all <laughs> in here." Like, and I was like dead serious about it, but. It never became like a stat thing for me, but mm. I made sure to give them my all every game, practice, mm-hmm. all that, just to – I ain't know where it was going to lead, you know what I'm saying, me going to the NFL and Canada and all that stuff mm-hmm. and playing. But I knew for the time I was there, we were going to turn it up. Mm. No, for sure. And, again, you do it that night against Ole Miss, man. And, again, I feel like we could spend an entire show just talking about that game. But but really quickly, just – reflect on that 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 it was one of those magical nights man where like you look back at the Spurrier tenure and you know every single coach I feel like whatever school they're at they have kind of that that breakthrough game or that game you sort of hang your hat on is that that was the one that sort of changed the culture and turned the tide and and really got things rolling And I think many Gamecock fans would really look back at that Thursday night against Ole Miss and and, and say that was the night man birth the sandstorm and the way you guys played and obviously how dominant the defense was it was just one of those special nights in Gamecocks football history yeah, it was a uh, that, that, that was a hell of a night. I mean, just because the way that game started, mm. like they actually, I want to say they they scored a touchdown early on or had a long explosive play, and they ended up calling it back. But I ended up missing a tackle. Mm. I think it was like Brandon Bolton just took off for like sixty or something, but they called it back. Mm. And it was like, all right, cool, like reset. Now we can go ball. You know what I mean? Mm. But yeah, I mean that whole that whole game was. It's crazy. Like the fans were just on ten that night. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they they all they were always all like just super lit all the time. But that night in particular, like Thursday night games, period. Yeah. In Columbia, just we used, we used to we used to love them Thursday night games with Spurrier, man. Every year. Yeah, most most definitely. But as a player, yeah. did you like did you did you like the Thursday night games? Was that like, or did you prefer Saturdays? I love Thursday night games. Yeah. Anytime I can get in it, that was one thing about me. If I could get a night game, yeah. <laughs> a national TV night game at that. National TV, because I got a lot of family in California. So right. that's when I was originally born before I moved to Texas mm. and started playing ball out there. And I was like, I got a ball for let them be able to see me because they weren't able to watch me much in Carolina right. until we had one of those prime time games. So it was always a major thing to me. Yeah. For sure. And you obviously showed up, man, when the lights shine brightest, for sure. And, you know, everybody remembers that game. I, I I know that we talked before the last time you were on, man, some of the bowl games you played in, obviously the uh, the 2006 Liberty Bowl. And then I know 07, what happened with that season was kind of crazy. But that 09 um, and then 08, of course, the uh, – what was it? The, the – I think was it the Outback Bowl against Iowa. Yeah, which was a, a really tough game. But then that 09 game, which it's funny to look back now. It wasn't so funny in the moment. But that, that Papa John's Bowl against UConn. Is that the most miserable football game you've ever played in? Uh, 
for one, Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> January. Yeah. A little early. I'm lactose intolerant. We probably had about 20 boxes of pizza. The whole time we were there, like, I don't know, that whole game was just, it was horrible. Yeah. It was cold. Like, UConn came out with no sleeves. You got these big ass 6'6, 330 pound old linemen screaming to run power O. And I'm just, damn. Then they had some running backs that was, they were loaded at running back at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, it was, that was, that was a game. Me and Shaq Wilson that game. Yeah. They, the running backs gave us a handful. Yeah. For sure. Well, either way, though, it, it wrapped up what was a fantastic career for you at South Carolina, man. Before we get into the Shane Beamer stuff, again, everybody wants to hear your thoughts on Shane. I would love to hear just a little bit about your professional career. I mean, obviously, you played for the Panthers and then ba- bounced around the Canadian Football League. And I remember last time, if I remember correctly, what you talked about the NFL and just the lessons and the experiences that you took away and learned because people don't realize, you know, it is a business. It is a business at that next level. And, and you learn that lesson very quickly and very harshly. But when you look back on your professional career, like what are your biggest takeaways from being a professional football player? Man, I think my biggest takeaways from it is just preparing every day and just mm. being able to like just get one percent better like every day. Like instead of progressing, progressing, and then taking that step back and then not really caring. You know what I'm saying? Like just to, to be able to be a pro is you got to have a short term memory. And it, it, it don't matter what you did in college. It don't matter what you did the game before. You know what I mean? It's what are you doing now? Can you consistently be what they need you to be? And I didn't I didn't really get the hang of that probably until going into like my second year. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And then, all right, cool. Going to my third year, got everything down, and things just went the way they went. And I was perfectly fine with that. But when I got to Canada – I was that guy. I was that professional guy. I was that, that leader in the locker room. I was everything that I needed to be when I was there in the NFL. And then when I had those chances to get back to the NFL, it was the same thing. Like when I went to go work out with Philly and the Giants and the Saints and all that stuff, like I was in the mini camp with the Saints, like I just I had it, I had it all down. You know what I mean? Like uh, I don't regret I don't regret none of it, man. Like I I love it. It's a hell of a game. Mm-hmm. They give it to you fast. They give you shit. Give you the world, but they they'll take it away from you in a heartbeat. Like they'll let you know that you're replaceable. Like it's not it's not college. It's like everybody is expendable. Like and it started with like I think people really started to notice like how tough the NFL was when Peyton Manning got cut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like everybody could go. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, like I said. It's a great, great place, great game, but it, it is a business. Yeah, and and, it, and everything happens for a reason, for sure. Everything happens for a reason. Obviously, you're in a great place now. I, again, I, I I lied. I want to talk about one more thing before we get into Shane Beamer. 2017, being inducted to the South Carolina Athletics Hall of Fame. Just what did that mean to you? Because, again, obviously, you know, you can just tell from the tone of your voice and me you talk about it. You love the University of South Carolina. You love the Gamecocks and everything they did for you and for your school to recognize you and give back to you in that way, inducting you in the Hall of Fame. And, of course, you're still, your name is still in the turnstiles at williams Bryce Stadium. Like, how much does that mean to you for Carolina to show that love back to you? I mean, it, they, Carolina always gave me the same thing I gave them back. I gave them 100% energy, and they always, always reciprocated it. And it, when that happened, I wasn't even expecting it. And I, I think I was just like a year off from retiring from the Canadian League. So – then that came about, and I'm just like, well, damn, like, it gave me a chance to re- kind of reflect on everything I did on my whole college and professional career. And I'm like, kind of made it happen, like, in your own little way. Like, things worked out. So, I mean, it, it was great. And I, I respect the university, and I appreciate it for that. And everybody that had a part in it, it inducted me into that, into the South Carolina Hall of Fame. I mean, it's something that's – it's like a degree. Can't nobody ever take it away from me. You know? Yep. Exactly. Now, Eric, let's get into the Shane Beamer stuff. You obviously see my hat. I'm rocking the Beamer ball hat. I feel like with what Shane Beamer is doing right now, I was joking with people. I might never take it off ever again. Um, but, but no, seriously. So you, it's very unique. You got to play for him. You, you got to build a relationship with him first as a player. And we all know, of course, fast forward 
to 2021. And like I told you, it's crazy how life comes full circle. And now he is literally the head football coach of the University of South Carolina. But first, as a player, because he got there in 2007, and Steve Spurrier brought him in. Obviously, we all know his track record with special teams and all that, but to be a master recruiter as well and a guy who could relate to players. And, you know, I thought it was really interesting, Eric, when Shane got the job and I, your name was somehow brought up and maybe there was a highlight or something like that. But Shane Beamer showed off the picture he has on his desk of you and him, I think like chest bumping or, or embracing or something like that. But as a player, what was it like going and or getting to know Shane? Because obviously you had been there for a year, but somebody who, again, really touched all parts of the team. What was he like as a player? What do you remember most about Shane Beamer during your time in Columbia at the University of South Carolina? Yeah, Beamer, for one, Beamer, that's my, that's my guy. That's my guy. He, he brought the same type of enthusiasm to the scout team. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Their special teams, when it was our time to get it in, it was intense. Like, he could just – I didn't even know I was – I didn't know nothing about special teams, block a punt, <laughs> how to block a punt, you know what I'm saying? All, all type of stuff. Like, but I mean, because Beamer, we just we just had that relationship. He he challenged you. But he challenged he he challenged you in the in the in like a in the best way possible, like kind of like your friend, like your, your homeboy, like, mm-hmm. like you can't go do this. I bet you won't do it. Like, shit, you did it. All right, do it again. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, all right, now. You got people blocking punts and doing all this stuff. And, you know, Beamer, Beamer's a guy, man. I mean, he's going he's gonna to change that culture. Mm. Crazy. Like, it ain't even no way to describe it. It's like, I think every player that's ever played for him will pretty much say, like, the same thing. That he's a leader. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's not one of those coaches that's, that's going to – he's not going to down talk to you. Mm. He ain't going to do nothing to uplift you, but he's going to coach the hell out of you. But he's gonna lift you up at the same time. Mm. And I mean, coaches like that these days, they they hard to find. I mean, uh, Coach Green was one of a kind and I was I was happy when he got the job. Shit, I'm still happy. I hope one day they're <laughs> coaching, one day he's still there yeah. just being on his staff somehow, mm. just because of the type of coach he is. And I, I know what he's gonna bring in that university and, mm. and the people that yeah. he's bringing back mm. to help build that, like with DeMarco and Shaq mm. Wilson and all those guys, it's like, you, 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 you can't beat that. He, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's going to get it done. He might need a little time, mm. but he's definitely going to make it happen, though. Yeah, and obviously the positive momentum right now, man, is through the roof with the recruiting trail. And I don't know how much, how much you've been able to see with that, but as we sit here right now, 10 commitments in the last 10 days. And I, I think people are really starting to take notice. And obviously, like you mentioned, man, your former teammates like DeMarco and Shaq Wilson, and I was able to – you know, talk with your guy Garcia a lot and, and a bunch of others. And when Shane Beamer got the job, man, it, it was, you know, I, I remember specifically, you know, once when South Carolina was on the on the coaching search and, and talking to all the guys that you played with, like you mentioned, that no Shane Beamer, you, you couldn't find anybody that had anything but great things to say about him. And everybody was just so elated when he got the job and got the opportunity. And I think it's, you know, for fans especially to – for it to be a Gamecock in charge and have an opportunity to put his stamp and his mark on the program, I think is something that's going to be, it, it, I know for a fact, is a real, real welcome change for, for Gamecock fans everywhere. Yeah, man. I mean, Gamecock Nation, they're going to love Beamer. They, they didn't really get a chance to know him like we did. Mm-hmm. So now they're going to be able to catch that side of him. And I think it's time, time progresses. It's, 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 it's going to be a love affair. I love Coach Beamer. <laughs> That's my dog. As crazy as it sounds, Eric, I want to see what Coach Beamer looks like pissed off. I, I don't know if anybody else has said that. I, I want to see Coach Beamer fired up a little bit. <laughs> you see it. <laughs> no, for sure. Eric, this has been a pleasure, man. Sincerely, I appreciate you taking the time, man. Like I said, it, it, it had been far too long since I last had you on the airwaves, and it's it just always such a pleasure to chat with you, man. One last thing before I let you go. Um, I'll kind of just let you have the floor. Your favorite memory, kind of off the wall memory. You don't have to go into. You can go to as into as little or much detail as you want. I know you talked yeah, about talk some about of the some, uh, of the, some of the, uh, the the post party, if you will, from some of the games during your time at Carolina, the Kentucky game, and I'm sure Ole Miss and many others. Rest in peace, five points, which is basically getting shut down right now. But uh, no, I mean it's things that stand out from your career at South kind of that, may, that maybe the common fan wouldn't necessarily know about. Oh man. Village. 
<laughs> of course. Shout out Brian Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Brian Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Hey man, yeah. High points in general, but village. Village, village. is that spot, man. Free ads, free plug for village right now. Yeah, free a free plug for village right now. They let not like they need it or anything. No, fantastic place. I was actually there this past weekend. So a fantastic venue. It's still kicking. It's still rocking and rolling. But, Eric, seriously, man, thank you for taking the time, man. This is absolutely a pleasure. And would love to get you back on. Obviously, the Shane train is rocking and rolling right now. We're all excited for Beamer in the 2021 season and for that to for that to get rocking, man. And, you know, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time. Like I said, I speak for all Gamecock Nation when I say it was an absolute pleasure to watch you do what you did. And we still look back and remember and, you know, think about how great a, how great of times those were and the great times that are yet to come, like we said, under Shane Beamer, man. I can't wait. So, appreciate you taking the time, Eric. Let's definitely do it again soon. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for having me on. For sure. He's Eric Norwood. I'm Chris Phillips. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you next time on an episode of the Spurs Up Show. Yeah.